Welcome in to Faith Today. I'm David. I'm the Rooster. I'm Chase. I'm Dick. And playing the part of the producer, I'm Chris. All right, well, this is Faith Today, where we take a look at the world around us through the lens of faith in Jesus. Real issues, real people, a real faith for a real world. All right, guys, thanks for joining us. This is Michael, who's joined us, uh, wants to be called the Rooster, and I think we can, um, we can accommodate that. We got a kind of a, a special topic this week. We're in Alabama. Um, I guess most of you know that, but we're in central Alabama. Over the last, um, over the last ten months, Alabama has hit, been hit by a series of pretty devastating tornadoes. Uh, it started with the April 27th tornadoes that swept through our state and killed. What was, what was the what was the casualty number? Three hundred. Three hundred. Yeah, so it was over three hundred. I remember immediate area it was two sixty six, but yeah. it was over three hundred. Yeah, it just uh, it killed a ton of people, devastated a lot of the communities around here. Um, we're still cleaning up from that, and and it's just. Uh, it, by the way, uh, we're not known as Tornado Alley, but Alabama has become uh, the worst place in America, and thus the whole world, because America is the kind of the tornado capital of the world. Uh, Alabama has become the tornado capital of the entire world as far as fatalities and strikes and things like that. Well, just two weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago today, uh, we had a series of storms come through uh, and hit. We're in northeast Birmingham, Pinson, Alabama. They hit within about a mile, two miles from here. Uh, we recorded another fatality. Hundreds of homes hit. And, and so today we're going to talk about the storms. We're going to talk about what, what is God's role in the storms. If God is all-powerful and all-good, why does he allow or not prevent or even send something that causes such devastation? And then we're going to talk about how the church responds. But first of all, I, I thought from, uh, particularly from Michael, from Nick, whose uh, mother-in-law's house was destroyed in the tornado, I thought we could get some, maybe some first-hand accounts of what you saw, what happened. Either one of you guys kick off. Nick, what, what happened with your mother-in-law? Well, uh, total d devastation of her house. Sorry, it's kind of. I'm gonna kind of stumble through part of this because it's really the first time um, I, I've talked at length about it with anybody outside of the immediate circle yeah. that it happened to. Um, my wife and I had been woken up. Um, you know, uh, Lisa has a weather app on her phone that actually woke her up. Um, she's pretty light sleeper anyway. She knew the storm. You know, she knew bad weather was possibility. And so, you know, she kind of was sleeping light, being prepared for that. App on her phone woke her up. Um, you know, it wasn't in time. Normally, my mother-in-law's house is our place to go for storms because she lives yeah. in a house with a basement. With, with a basement and specifically a storm shelter built into it. So usually that's our, our go-to place. Um, talk about God's role in it. Personally, I believe it was grace that we didn't go there that night, and we can, we can talk about that later. But um, Lisa was woken up. We, um, we did the normal, you know, go to the most interior room of your house, you know, put the kids in the bathtub, had blankets and pillows just in case things got worse and we needed to kind of shield them. Um, I, you know, I was kind of watching the news, kind of, you know, if I, th things started going bad, I could duck in there real quick, but Lisa was in there with the kids to kind of keep them calm. And I was watching the news and it just, it, it seemed like another storm that could have been that wasn't from what we saw immediately um, on the news. We went back to bed and um, we'd gotten the kids, and the kids were just about settled. Lisa or I were, you know, kind of just chatting because we were awake at that point or waiting to go back to sleep. And um, we got a text message and then, you know, later a call from her, a text message from her sister and a call from her mom saying, our house is gone. Can you come get us? And, um, you know, at the time, I don't think my mother-in-law realized how bad it was because, um, you know, a short time after we got back to the house, she was talking about, you know, when it's light, we need to go back. And. She was thinking practical things. She needed to find her purse so she get her driver's license. You know, uh, my sister-in-law um, wanted to go get her phone charger just because, you know, she, well, Meg had lost her phone. Meg ha didn't have her phone, my mother-in-law, and Kelly's phone was dying, so she wanted to get the charger I'm so they could communicate. I'm grimacing because I saw your house, and well, the idea of finding a piano or a <laughs> bathtub in it is, is incredible, well, much less uh, something small like a phone and, and charger. That's, and that's what was tough because when I went to pick him up, um, I didn't know where they were. You know, Lisa got the call. We grabbed sweatshirts, um, grabbed blankets, and I and I left. Yeah. And um, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't. I didn't know anything. And I'm I'm driving up to their neighborhood, and I'm I'm looking at the line of the neighborhood where there should be houses, and there right. aren't. And the first when I walk into the neighborhood, the house on the left that's 
it's a three-story house, two above of ground, and and I see the roof to where I could reach up and touch it. Yeah, and it's I'm, a nice I'm going in and, and I'm going, oh, okay, we're this is this is real now. Yeah. and and I and I was literally speechless, and so I walked down to where I know their their house is, and and had I not recognized my sister-in-law's car first, my mother-in-law's after that, I wouldn't have known it was their lot in the moment. Yeah. There was no house. Yeah, you're right. And I think my mother-in-law thought the house had been damaged. Yeah. And, it, and I, you know, when we got back to the house, you know, and they were talking about that, I, I pulled my wife aside and I'm like, Lisa, she didn't realize there's not a house. And um, come to find out, it was, it was gone. Just not kind of damaged. It was gone. Like, it, the best we can figure, it was picked up or, you know, it was turned on its side and, and pushed. And so it, it, I don't, I still don't have the work. I mean, we worked in the house two days right after that. Um, you know, a bunch of people helped us clean up the Saturday after. And it still doesn't feel real in some regards. It's just, it's just unreal. Well, I went to the house. You're right. The devastation is amazing. That piano from that house yep. was deposited into the basement of the neighbor's Yeah, house. it had been in her living room, so on, on the, the ground level. Um, and it was in her in her neighbor's basement. Yeah, I don't I, actually. I, having seen where uh, your mother-in-law and sister-in-law h- hid out from mm-hmm. the storm, I don't know how they actually walked out because there was so much debris between where they were and and getting out. Well, thank you know I I, I I literally thank God for this. They had a neighbor who, after he got his family saved, or saved, excuse me, safe, you know, out of their house and, and um, to emergency workers, he kind of walked around because he knew. Um, it was really just Meg and, and Kelly at home, and um, I guess they found like a two by six, like a um, what would have been an I beam or something yeah, in the yeah. house, and they used it kind of as a ramp, and he he helped them up out. Oh, okay. um, from that corner. Yeah, from okay. well, I, I'm not exactly sure because part of that wall got kind of yeah. pretty well beat up, so, so somewhere along that back wall, he helped them out. Come to find out, this guy um, had been hit in the head with a cinder block trying to keep his family safe. Oh my gosh. And and this saint of a guy comes to help my mother in law. So huge thanks to to him. Um, a lot of heroes him. in this Oh thing. look man, I, I, I wanted to give that dude a hug. Uh, yeah. you know, it's, it, when I found out what all he went through, I just I, I have been overwhelmed by um, a group of teenagers that um, live in clay just randomly showed up on Monday to help. Like yeah. weren't organized. They were just friends that were like, Hey let's go help. Hey so much cool stuff you know I know we'll get to this in a minute, but we talk about where is God in it, calls that allowed it, you know, so on and so forth, and I, I can't answer that question. It, I, it's, it's too big of a question. What I do know is I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the outpouring of community yeah. that, that I did see, and, I, and it was completely encouraging Yeah, that awesome. I do know. So. Well, that morning, I, I actually made it into Paradise Valley before it was dark. Uh, I have a little bit of, uh, I graduated from EMT school, um, have some law enforcement training, thought maybe I could help because it was my old neighborhood. Mm-hmm. In fact, my old street was one of the ones, uh, Balboa Terrace, that was devastated. Uh, we saw people being pulled out uh, from houses, you know, broken. Um, we thought maybe dying. It turns out they didn't die, but it was just it was just utter devastation. Shocking to, I was in there when it was dark, uh, when it was still dark, and to see the sun slowly rise in this neighborhood with hundreds of houses destroyed is it, very sobering. Mm-hmm. Now, now, Michael, I know you ran on this storm as a firefighter. Uh, you were in center point, but your, maybe your deeper experience was actually in the April 27th storms. Talk about, th- talk about that. Talk about running in Pleasant Grove. What did you see? What did you experience? Now, the closest thing you can always say of what it looked like when you got there was any still photography you saw from Hiroshima or Nagasaki. It's wiped. Yeah. Normally houses would be one of like three things. Sometimes hardly any damage. Sometimes moved off the foundation and thrown 30 feet or just pancaked down. Mm -hmm. That's generally, you know, how it went depending on which ones you saw. Um, But it really was just like as you said, you know, and, and it is different when it's at night, and then when you see it in the daylight, and when you just look across where you used to see rows and rows, and there ain't no rows. There's no trees. There's no sound. There's no birds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's just a silent stillness that sits. In That's you're right about the silence. That's something that now that you bring it up, I, I remember that next day. 
Okay, sorry. No, no, I'm just, I mean, you'll hear chainsaws and you hear things right. like that. But other, when everything stops, it's just an uncomfortable silence, like in a conversation with two people when no one knows what to say. Mm -hmm. It sort of goes like that. And that's, you know, it's sobering. It's, you know, you, we're trained not to react. Yeah. That's what we do. And I think I spent 30 something hours at Pleasant Grove. We were on the ground two hours after it hit Concord trying to help people, doing what you can. Our grid searches through Pleasant Grove, you'd walk by and they had taken a blanket or something and covered up a body where they wow. were trying to, you know, um, saw a human heart on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. And the doctor who was with us, you know, pointed out the four chambers, so you knew it was a human heart. You don't know where it came from. Because uh, you got debris, you know, from that one scattered everywhere. You had yeah. stuff from Tuscaloosa showing up in Pleasant Grove and stuff like that, just because of the magnitude of what that thing was. But I tell you, you know, you talked about people and, and doing something, and I, I will say this, when we were doing what I did, what I found more, um, I guess, special, or, or however you want to put it when we were there, is you'd have all those people come out offering us to give us, offering to give us water. Mm. When we're searching through the rubble, these are the people who just had their stuff. <laughs> yeah. And they're, hey, y'all need any food? Y'all need any water? And the kindness displayed there, I mean, it was just, you know, something that would melt your heart, just because, you know, Yes, we're trying to help. Yes, we're doing everything we can do to do what we're, you know, but but that's what we do. Right. It's it's not a movement from a different direction. Right. If you have an occupation, you know, you're a banker, you don't go be a sniper on the weekends. It's not one of those things. It's That's what we do. We don't consider it something different. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, when they say you have ordered chaos, we're there. That's what we do. And just to see that, though, you know, the people trying to bring us water and things, and you're walking through these neighborhoods. We did grid searches. You had a nice little pattern, and like I said, you, your old neighborhood, well, we had to use grid searches, and that was the only way you could really find where you were going. You know, occasionally you'd see a sign to kind of, you yeah. know, know where everything was, and we had people who were, who had been in that area a long time, too, and, you know, it's, you should know where you're at, but you don't because it's just, yeah, everything's gone. And so, you know, we used the grid searches. And, and another thing, it, it, it was very, um, you know, depending on people's opinion on pets, um, the amount of people that were thoroughly concerned about their pets. <laughs> you know, it's, it's neither here nor there, but I will always say, if you want to learn a lesson in unconditional love, get a dog. Yeah. Because that dog will teach you something more than anything else, because mm. you can be mean to it. And I say mean to it, it does something wrong, you want to kill it. That's just human nature, because it doesn't understand how you're speaking to it. <laughs> sit and it's just running around wagging its tail you no know, uh, don't bite that and you, you know you'll go nuts and crazy and, and and try to be mean to it or everything well you know when everything calms down that dog's gonna love you mm. he's gonna lay down beside you and that's unconditional love but seeing the measure that people had for that you know you know i was just helping out you know where hey can y'all help me get my dog got trapped out i think we did that i think we saved a dog from underneath wow. something because yeah. the, the homeowner was so concerned yeah. wow um but like I said, it's, it was just devastation. I mean, that's the only way to put it. It's the yeah. only way to take it. And if you've never seen anything firsthand account of it, like y'all did, it can't be measured or expressed in words. And it can't be, well, we show a photograph and people are going to know. No. You can't really, you can't you really have to grasp be, the magnitude no. on TV. <laughs> you or, have or to be standing internet. in the middle of yeah. it. And that's with most things. Yeah. Unless you have experience, you can't tell anybody else about it. Yeah. And that has more applications than just this. But, you know, unless you're standing there and you see what used to be a subdivision and it's not there anymore, you can't describe that to anybody. And especially if you had people living there or had been there several times, you know, you know this place. Mm -hmm. And then look in and go, everything's gone. Yeah. yeah. So I, it, it was wild because my, you know, my kids were there um, that afternoon before it happened. It happened on Monday morning. So Sunday afternoon, Lisa and the kids had been there. And, you know, Monday when we were cleaning up, um, the rubble, I, I found a box of crayons mm -hmm. that Maggie probably had out on yeah. Sunday. And that, and, you know, part of Meg's house having knocked over the tree, Maggie used to cl love to climb in. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it, speechless. I mean, it's yeah. just, it, you know, it, yeah, I'll, that, that, nothing hit me so hard as just, I remember taking two steps into her neighborhood that night. I went to pick him up and just, you know, the, it was raining. And so that, you know, that always adds to the, you know, the, the um, experience or whatever. But, you know, looking to the left and seeing that house gone, seeing the rain, seeing, you know, the emergency vehicles and everything, you just, 
it was this sense that, you know, it's just that whole life has changed kind of thing. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it, even going back and looking at the pictures now, I remember how I felt, but it still isn't as real. It's, it, it, it's intangible. It's, it's, it's indescribable, but it's, anyway. Well, I mean, speechless to that. some degree, if the person is the one who's lived through it, mm -hmm. unlike us, we just come in. Right. Um, when you look at them, I mean, you've got to think you're standing in one of the closest places you can get to hopelessness mm -hmm. that can be felt by mm -hmm. a human being. Yeah. Regardless of loss of any, you know, not physical loss of life, right. but just, you know, most people have acquired what they've acquired through years. And I'm not talking about, for, you know, possessions that cost a lot of money, but sure. possessions that may have had sentimental value, yeah. mm -hmm. like this was my mother's this or my father's this. Absolutely. This. And now it's all swept away. Mm -hmm. It's gone. You know, and then and it's up, you know, it's a, it's a catch-22 because they can always say, well, we think we're alive. But after that passes, because mm -hmm. you're going to have a period where you're really not aware, like your mother-in-law was, mm -hmm. that everything was as mm -hmm. bad as it was. And then and it's almost like Kubler-Ross's levels of steps, you know. You're going to have then you accept the fact that it did. But once you get to the fact that you're going through everything, and it may be months down the road, and then you'll get into the, well, I wish I still had this. And... And what a lot of people don't realize on that stuff, too, on the living through the storms, that's where you get PTSD from. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be the military. Everybody thinks PTSD was military. Uh -uh. Post-traumatic stress occurs in any situation where there is a trauma mm -hmm. or an uprooting of life. That, and that's you'll just start something seeing, we've been talking about. You'll start seeing that usually in the months after. It's mm -hmm. usually three to six months is when. Really? Wow. That's usually when that stuff helps. I mean, they critically debrief us after we see it. You know, we're supposed to go through and sit down with stuff. And depending on the severity, as in the case in the April ones, we actually had a psychiatrist come to us wow. and talk to us and then talked about, you know, sleep loss is one of the major things. And they were willing to write a prescription to us after speaking to us. I mean, it mm -hmm. wasn't one of those where we're just handing them out like candy uh, for that reason because you had people, and a lot more over there, too, because, see, I, I'm not from that particular region. A lot of those people I work with are. Yeah, okay. So they had a deep personal connection mm -hmm. with this. I didn't. Mm -hmm. So I was able to shut myself off right. in terms of an emotional state, which I do usually when I work. Mm -hmm. You go blank slate. You do yeah. what you're supposed to do. Yeah. But that's what you do. But they, they might have that trouble, but when you, you get into situations like that, you will, you know, police and firemen, and more so firemen, actually have the highest rates of PTSD than any other body, anybody else. Hmm. It's not really quote unquote relatable in some sense because they don't talk about it mm -hmm. or it'll get to the state that they have to right but you know it's one of those things and in seeing some of the things like that that's what but that's in everybody it can cause that yeah you know the dwelling on it mm -hmm. the reoccurring nightmares I know particular people I know who you know, a buddy of mine I work with now worked at Pleasant Grove now works with us mm -hmm. and he is wife and two children left their house, went to the neighbor's house, they were saved, his house got flattened, he's at work. So imagine being a guy who can't leave where you're at knowing your family mm. has been <laughs> you know, no, no, no. until he can make contact. Uh, he lost his dog. It died. Had that dog since it was a puppy, Rottweiler. Wow. Um, we were fortunate that I uh, had some connections and I knew some people with some puppies. And so for Christmas this year, we were able to get them one. And, uh, I always joke about it, but no kid should be out without a dog, you know, especially in that sense. But his his daughter, his son's a little, he's he's smaller. His daughter will, if it starts raining, she, she gets scared. Wow. And that's really more now what you deal with post, that's what you deal with. You know, all this is happening now, and, you know, it's going to take three to six months. You know, you still got to clean lots, and you, you got to wait for the insurance companies, and, which in Alabama they should be used to this by now. Uh, but just, you know, they have, you, there's a process you're going to have to entail of what you're going to have to do just from a business side of it, not to sound like that, but, you know, finding oh, a new is. place Look. to live, yeah. getting more possessions. And I'm not just talking about just, I mean, stuff that's just casual that you need. Like when you get the new house, you've got to have a couch, yeah. a, you know, coffee maker like, and stuff. Restock your kitchen. Exactly. Like that's, you know, my mother-in-law moved into um, her, her temporary residence yesterday, actually. Um, spent the first night there last night. And they're going through the kitchen, and you know, she was looking through it. She called my daughter, who was, or my wife, her daughter, uh, who was going shopping, you know, 
quick run to the store today. He's like, hey, can you pick me up salt and pepper and garlic? It's like, you don't think about wow. needing that. It's just always there. But now, how much stuff have you acquired through the years yep. that you've acquired and it's just always been there? And you don't, you don't think about it. You, you don't, don't think about yeah, going. And, 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 and I'm talking about stuff that usually is not in that category that will break down after a certain period of time that you're used to buying mm -hmm. one, like a coffee maker every two, three years, stuff like that. I'm talking about just stuff that's always there. You know, the microwave's always been there. Mm -hmm. The range, the stove, it's always been there. You don't think about that yeah. but yet. And then you've got the huge one that I'm in a place that's not home. That yeah. feeling of yeah. home, mm -hmm. that's not where you're at. Yeah. Home yeah. is gone. Home is gone. Yeah. I mean, you're not home, quote unquote. And, yeah. and that's, you know, a lot of people, if they work hard or they do this, or I don't know how old your mother-in-law is or if she works or anything like that, but there's a certain sense of rest mm -hmm. that can only be accomplished by being home. Mm -hmm. You don't have that anymore. Well, let's, let's go a little deeper here. I mean, look, you, you were, you've shared with us some of the things you saw, I mean, a human heart, you saw That's uh, multiple people that were killed by the storms, particularly in Concord when you were running there. Pleasant Grove. Uh, Pleasant Grove. Um, I didn't. I didn't see anybody that, that was killed. I saw uh, people being pulled out of the houses, uh, hysterical husbands, uh, uh, people on stretchers, just just going crazy. That were just literally pulled out of the rubble. You've seen family members' houses destroyed. I mean, the fact of the matter is, these storms are devastating. And, and look, some of you may be watching this and you're thinking, well, you know, that's tough for you Alabamians, but we don't have to deal with storms. Let's get a bigger picture look here. We're going to talk about catastrophe in general, whether it be a catastrophe like these storms that come in and sweep houses away and kill people and such, or whether it be catastrophe like you, David. You had a father uh, who was a police officer, uh, uh, your best friend who was, who was shot and uh, suffered greatly. I mean, we're... All of us are going to face a m community level catastrophe or a personal level catastrophe. So I guess we start with where's God in the storms? And, and I think we can talk about where's God literally in the tornadoes that ha hit Alabama. But I also want to talk about where's God in the storms that hit your life on an ongoing mm -hmm. basis and hit my life on an ongoing basis. Because I think this is one of the, the and not one of the, this is the top reason that uh, people who aren't followers uh, of Jesus or even people who are atheists that would give for not believing in a good God because he either allows or causes or doesn't prevent so much evil. So l let's start subjectively and maybe build towards the word. David, wh what do you, wh where's God in the storms? Hey, you know, I was thinking about the, there's a, there's a passage, this, one of the Psalms that talks about that um, even though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. And, and one thing I, I just would point out is I, and I always start kind of at this point. I think that I think that what God prevents from happening, what what God keeps out of our lives, you know, we, we don't think about those things. I, I think we don't just day to day. We get up in the morning, we go and we do our routine and we go to bed at night. And we don't think anything about and I don't know that we'll ever know or get to see what he prevents yeah. from coming into our life. Maybe, maybe in eternity we will, but I, I, I believe that. I believe from the moment we wake up to the morning we go, uh, to the moment we go to bed that God is, is keeping us from things um, and protecting us and shielding us. And then, I, and then there's these moments where something like this happens. And I, you know, in this case, I look at, at, at Nick's uh, mother-in-law and think, you know, she really sees that verse. Even though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. Their life was preserved. And the house was not, but her, her life was and, and her family was. Uh, but then you have to deal with the fact that, you know, two miles down the road, there was a family that lost, you know, their the daughter, daughter, and their daughter. And, and so, you know, where, you know, how do you, how you relate all of these things? And, uh, you know, I do believe God is sovereign over, uh, creation, but I believe it is a fallen creation, and, and I believe that, um, you know, from time to time, anywhere in the world, uh, we see the consequences of sin, and, and we see it playing out. I think the Bible speaks to that. Uh, you know, you can get into the question, why does God, uh, you know, why does God steer, you know, why does God, why does it, you know, a family over here is devastated. A family over here, you know, I haven't said a lot. Um, I was out of town. Uh, we were on vacation, um, and 
you know, that morning for me the, in the most recent storms um, was one of, I was getting texts, I'm, I'm on vacation, I'm getting woke up by text message after text message from people, hey, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay? And I'm like, what? You know, it's quite honestly, it's sunny and 80 where I'm at. Yeah. And I'm like, what, what is going on? And I start reading, a tornado has hit. And, and, you know, it hit less than half a mile from my house. I yeah. mean, had it shifted, you know, a quarter of a mile, half a mile, one direction, I would have been getting text messages from where I was that, hey, your house is gone. Well, that's the thing. That was yeah. surreal because I was actually, once I found out how far the path of the storm was, I, when we drove down um, one of the main roads that leads to y'all's place, I was actually kind of peeking into y'all's neighborhood to see if it looked like it was one that was hit because I'm like, oh, crud, you know, yeah. they're not even there, yeah. you know. So, my, my, you know, what I'm saying is there's, you know, in, we're spared and there, there were people who were devastated and there were people who their lives were kept safe. There was a, a, a family lost a daughter. There, there's a level there of God's sovereignty that is very difficult to speak to. And, and, you know, there are times where I think God shields us. There are times where we go through trials and difficulties. Um, you know, not to how many storms we've been protected from. This is one yes. where, you know, your, you know, again, you know, your, your in-laws were devastated, their lives protected. Um, I believe where is he in the midst of these storms? It's a fallen creation and... And he is there, and he is sovereign over these things. Uh, but the Bible speaks very clearly, this is not heaven. This is a fallen creation. And we deal with the consequences of living in a fallen creation. The Bible speaks to that. If, if we didn't deal with these consequences, then the Bible would not be truthful. Yeah. We, you know, but we're living out a real-life realization of that, that grace, that the preventative grace that you're talking about. Because um, up until about a week and a half to a week before the storm, I had a brother-in-law that was living in my mother-in-law's as well. And he had just now moved out. Mm -hmm. And um, the room that my mother-in-law and sister-in-law went to was actually his old room. And talking about how we, that's normally our storm shelter. Well, usually the way the storms work is most everybody's in the storm shelter. And one person is usually kind of watching out the back door to the basement and um, I, I'll email you a picture and maybe you can you can kind of put it up there wasn't a basement and so any of us that had been standing at that back door as we normally would have would have been gone you know maybe by grace we could have been preserved but the bad by the look of the house yeah. we would have easily been just tossed yeah to that was the place you, know. you guys normally go yes right? that's the thing if, you know, if if it had happened at Eight o'clock. That you know, or if maybe one of us would have been hour, standing in a doorway that's not there, that was not there when I got. If you'd there. had an hour's notice, yes, you know. But you know, jo Joel, my brother-in-law, you know, he's kind of one of the watch from the front porch guys if it gets real bad. One of us is usually kind of watching from the basement just to know if we need to kind of hunker down. And apparently, as quick as this happened yeah, to people, it's fast. Some of us would have been killed. And so, you know, it, you talk about that preventative grace, and all of a sudden. I, I guess that's the thing for me, and I, and I grieve deeply for the, the family that did lose their daughter, but I'm thankful on our end because I do see that preventative grace realized. And, you know, like my mother-in-law's neighbor, they had, they had just gotten home, somebody had, either had just gotten home from work or was getting ready to go to work, and so the house was kind of unsettled because of their arriving or leaving, and so whenever the, the sirens and everything went off, they were more alert. And you, you kind of hear more stories about that. Because this happened at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. This is not a normal no, time for most people, except for <laughs> your schedule. Yeah, but. we were we were up. I mean, where we are at is usually what is in the path of every storm that comes out of Tuscaloosa. Mm -hmm. You're pretty much you're defcon yeah. at that point. So we were up for the entire time. Yeah. You know, now once it passed us, we got to settle down a little bit. But then you're looking for if we've got to run someplace else, right? Because we're you we you know a, a basic USAR team, and we. Something like that. You go to that place. Right. You know, we load up, get our technical rescue, uh, you know, trailer, and we go to that place. So we were, you know, we're up continuing. But you're right. If you're going from a completely asleep, and that's why, you know, not to plug anything, but everybody really should have a battery operated yeah. weather radio. Yeah. I mean, it's you got to the sirens won't wake yeah, you exactly, up. Yeah, exactly. Because some half the time they don't even go off sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I mean, that's one thing. And and the apps on the phone. I think the the number was twenty thousand. Apps have been downloaded for Droid and wow. iPhone since April 27th. Yeah. Wow. One of the problems with those, you know, is that, uh, 
at least on mine, is you know, you get a really bad storm, we don't get great cell coverage. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean you don't get three, that's why three the, G coverage, you know, and all of a sudden the weather radio is usually your yeah. best bet yeah. because it's going to go off. Oh yeah, yeah. we're. Uh, yeah. And hey, you know, I hear people say, well, well, let's get more specific to area, you know, because it's only, it's going to go by county. So yeah. you could be in one part of the county, it ain't even close, but it's going to go off. Personally. I'd rather have it where it wakes me up. I, yeah. Look, man. Hey, if I get up and I'm good, hey, I'm good. Hey, I yeah, go I go bed. back to sleep. Yeah. We're fine. Yeah. yeah. But in terms of, you know, it'd be, be you know, the prepared. And, but I will say this. I think with all that happening, people buying the weather radios after April 27th, mm -hmm. you know, because I was at one of those events where the news came out and they sold them out within about an hour. Yeah. And, you know, we were doing the programming and stuff. Uh, but if you look at what happened in April, most of everything that was averted Mm -hmm. For the most part, was because of that. Yeah. Had you probably not had that, this would have been that with the fatalities and things yeah. like that. I mean, it had to take something. Yeah. To, you know, where it, everybody learns basically. Yeah. And but it's back. You know, the fire right. response yeah. was that way. Right. I mean, in terms of how they got mobilized, how yep. they did, because they did wonderful mm -hmm. given what they got. But I don't think you'd have had this without that. without April twenty seventh. Without April twenty seventh. Let me yeah. ask you a question. What about what about someone who is who's watching or someone who would say uh, God God um, you know nothing bad like this you, you, you attribute to God or his either permissible will or uh, what he um, uh, commands but rather um, this type of devastation would have been caused by Satan yeah. Satan would have controlled the weather in this situation to cause this kind of destruction what that's a, that's a great question it's worth wrestling listen we're going to look into something for the next couple of minutes, not easy for any of us to deal with, not easy for people out there watching who has had a loss to think about. But uh, we, want to, we want to speak the truth in love, and we want, to look at, we want to look at that. I think there are scriptural instances in the book of Job and other places where natural disasters happen and, and Satan is involved in them uh, in, in, a, in a direct sort of way. There are instances where natural disasters happen, and it's it's just a part of being in a world in the world. I mean, for instance, you're you're in, based in Hueytown. Look, Oak Grove, Concord, Hueytown, Minor, that area. This place is constantly assaulted by tornadoes. It's not because God hates that area. Mm -hmm. There's some natural reason for it, mm -hmm. and, and, and Jesus talks about that. He he, he asks the question to. Uh, to his audience, he says, what about those Jews that were killed when the Tower of Siloam yeah. crashed? He says, yeah, yeah. So, it, were they worse sinners than everybody else? And he says, no, they weren't. But I tell you what, unless you all repent, you will, re you will perish too. So here you have a natural disaster that happens, and it's, it's obviously not caused by, uh, apparently not caused by God or Satan, but it just, it just happened. happened. Now here's the you got a verse. Let's Wait, see. Go ahead and share that because I got a couple too. Okay, when we first started, you know, talking about the the back and forth, and th this is the first verse that came to mind, John sixteen thirty three, and it's it's Jesus speaking. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Look, you know, that where I am you may also be. Yeah, it, you know, I'm reading through X. I'm um, started reading the Bible over, and I'm reading through Exodus right now, and you have, you know. God making a point through the plagues. Some yeah. of them supernatural, seemingly. Then you have the darkness, it, the hail, which is a natural, um, not the darkness, but the hail can be a natural. That was obviously, you know, a natural instance was supernatural. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, ah, whatever. Y'all know what I'm trying to say. But, you know, you've got Job, those kind of interactions. I think we just live in a fallen world. I think it's, we do. I think, it, I think this, is more is I think it's less a you know used to harden Pharaoh's heart kind of thing. I, th I think it's more of a the tower that fell that Jesus speaks of. You know, in this world you'll have trouble. Stuff's going to go bad because our world's be broken. It's promised. Yeah. And that that word there, trouble, is actually the, the Greek word for tribulation. It's mm -hmm. it's like a it's like a mega trouble. It is promised in Scripture that we will have catastrophe and trouble and tribulation. Mm -hmm. If it didn't happen, you were alluding to this earlier. If it didn't happen, Jesus would be a liar. Mm -hmm. Now here's the thing. God could have prevented those tornadoes from hitting mm -hmm. anywhere. You you told me earlier, uh, as as a firefighter, and you're not you're not an old guy. You're younger than me. Um, as a firefighter, you've seen over a thousand 
I mean, people it's just, die. It's ballpark, just you know, a, a lot of dead bodies. A lot of dead bodies. Look, God is powerful enough to prevent everyone. Every person that you've seen die has had a family and has had people whose hearts were ripped out by that death. How does God, how does a good God allow those things to happen when he could have prevented them? Furthermore, you have some instances in Scripture where God causes calamity. For instance, you, you have, uh, we've talked a lot here about persistence in prayer. Mm -hmm. You have Elijah who prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain for years. God answered that prayer. He stopped the rain. Listen, back in the day, that kind of thing happened. People die. Children die when that happens. What in the world is going on here? How in the world could we, all of us Christians, how in the world could we serve a God who doesn't prevent evil, or in some cases, allows and could cause catastrophe to happen? That's a, that's a tough, that is a tough question. I'm a little hesitant to ask it, but how do we serve a God like that? What do you guys think? There's a, uh, you know, one, one question that you hear a lot, uh, you know, along those lines, I guess, is, you know, why doesn't God, why, why doesn't God stop evil? I, and I go back, and, you know, I'm not trying to be simplistic, but it is, you know, this is, this is not the pre-fall earth. This is not, you know, what you see in Genesis 1 in, in creation is you see perfect harmony. There was harmony with, between God and man. There was harmony between uh, mankind between each other. There was harmony with God, uh, excuse me, with man and creation. Mm -hmm. and, and then the fall happens and everything's disrupted. You see a disruption between God and man, uh, that separation that has to take place. You see disruption between people because yep. all of a sudden now Adam and Eve are ashamed in each other's presence. And you see disruption between man and creation. Mm -hmm. God starts saying, you're going to have to, you know, the earth is not going to be kind to you, in other words. You're going to have to work hard to get anything from, from the earth now. And so those disruptions are caused by the fall. Romans 8 says, uh, Paul wrote, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, and in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. So the, what Romans teaches is creation is under a curse that was placed Paul, here <laughs> by the fall, and, and creation actually groans, in some translations, longs to be set free, and one day it will be. And, and so when people ask the question, why doesn't God stop all evil? He will. There will be a day where God will bring an end to all suffering and all evil. But according to Peter... When that day comes, I mean, it will happen by God bringing his final judgment. And every person who doesn't believe in Christ will perish. And Peter actually says, we're not living right now in God's forgetfulness. We're not living right now in God's, uh, you know, where he has forgotten, you know, his promises. We are living in his patience because, you know, he is being patient with people in order that they come to repentance. And in that patience, that means that this fallen world continues to spin. It continues. We have to live continually in this fallen creation until that day he brings it to an end and brings all suffering and all evil uh, to its finality. And, you know, I think, you know, to me, what you see happening is these verses. God says, you will walk in the midst of trouble. I will preserve your life. I think there are times where he preserves us from trouble and calamity that we never know about. I think there are times where he preserves us physically, even mm -hmm. in the midst of trouble, like happened with your yeah. uh, mother-in-law. But then the ultimate protection is that when that time comes, and it's time for us to go, and that happens for everybody, where we have that ending moment of life here, for everyone who believes in Christ, he protects our life for all of eternity. Mm -hmm. So his protection is, is following us all the days of our lives in some form or fashion or another. And I realize that doesn't make the suffering easy, but I think the suffering is explained in those terms, that this is the fall that, that we deal with. And God, in some way or another, preserves us through the fall. And, and I won't go into these verses, but he does promise that he will also take those consequences, the suffering that we face, and he will do something with it that is fruitful and good. So no matter what comes into our life, he turns around and brings something good out of it in well, some form or fashion. Now this is going to th throw the curveball here, but I realize that, you know, being ministers that y'all are, 
This is not to say anything. This is just going to be a different take, perhaps, maybe, than y'all may or may not look at. With death that I've seen, and sometimes when they're older people or something like that, you've got a preparedness that it's coming. Hmm. You know, and so you can build your grief to the point where most in most cases when it gets near the end, you know, you're praying that God, if it's your will to heal them, go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. If not, you let them go. Sure. Now, you're still going to have to go through them stages and do all that. But with things like this, it's the unexpected finality. Because you could just say, why, God, did you do this with a tornado victim as easy as you can say, why did it with the drunk driver that killed somebody in the car? Mm -hmm. It's all the same thing. Because to me, when all this comes, we can debate why the tornadoes happen. And you can even go with it's a meteorological phenomenon that over the years has progressed because we've added more houses and we've basically put more things in the path of things that would not have been or it's not in historical record because nothing was there mm -hmm. or you know just different things like that and you can explain that you can even throw Lewis in there and say that pain is God's megaphone to a deaf world that unless we lose something we don't know how much we needed it yeah. or that how much we need him to get over it and that's all good and well but dealing with the loss of people mm -hmm. then it really becomes why to me and the, the well it becomes why from that no, person's perspective uh, oh look I, I'm with you yeah it's that person's perspective and what I look at is you know I've grown up seeing the backside of religion my whole life being a preacher's kid and might be the way I am sometimes always wanting to push buttons but from an outside perspective and you talked about atheists and people like that and looking at the logical the comfort to a family that's lost is not going to be eased up so much by explaining it like you just broke it out which was cool and I admit probably is a really good explanation but the loss from an unconsolable source doesn't get fixed that way and and we can say this because we're this is hey we're thinking out theologically speaking sure. and hypothetically speaking but what I worried about worry about God's response to the church or what should the church do is the Sunday school type religion of oh just pray about it or oh you'll get through it or oh get through this unless you've experienced that loss or a loss in that context you don't even need to talk to nobody about it you can comfort them. You can be there for them. Your presence will mean more than trying to to, to speak. And I'll, and I'll speak, you know, not necessarily trying to detract from your point, but that's something I saw that was really cool of a lot of, of you know, churches in that community is that they just showed up and they just helped. They didn't, you know, the sandwich they hand out may have had a little sticker with their website address on it. They weren't handing out tracts and Bibles and saying, you know, this is our agenda for Sunday. Some of the pastors you wouldn't know were pastors. They just got in there with chainsaws and hatchets and went to work. And I, th and I thought that was cool. It's refreshing, but I'm really more talking about after all that's what's going on. Okay, I, mean, I, I was thinking. with the loss and just the advice that some people would I see give them. I, just you know, because, man. you know, you're talking about people when they go through something like that, it's a razor's edge mm -hmm. that they're walking. A, they find faith, hope, love. Mm -hmm. They find the grace mm -hmm. to move past it, not that you, it's always, a, you know, left in your heart. Or you fall off the edge mm -hmm. and you have bitterness. I mean, it's a fine line depending on, Look. depending on where they, how much may, they may have had to begin with or that place that they feel. I had a, a before the events of April 27th, beginning of April, we had something that happened to me and my wife that was, you know, we, we had a miscarriage. My wife's older than I am. We had never thought that we would get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And in one week's time, you went from the joy of elation yeah. to the desperation. Yeah. Now, that being said, that's a why question and a why moment, mm -hmm. just like this. Mm -hmm. So in that, I remember walking out and fixed in my mind is the monitor that had the date that my baby would be born on. I can see it plain as day. 
and I got to the truck. And then, you know, I was coming from work. I'd just gotten off, and, you know, it was a, it was a whole blow-up of things because we had to drive home separately. Mm -hmm. Even though I said, hey, I'll, I'll, you know, drive. Because I'm the guy who's supposed to be now. You've got to, quote-unquote, be the strong one. Because that's what men are supposed to do. And I remember getting to it, and I put her in her vehicle. And I remember getting to the Jeep. And the only thing that came through my head was the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Yeah. And of course, uh, you probably know the story of the gentleman who wrote it and about how he had lost an infant son, he had lost a lot in the Great Chicago Fire, sent his family to England, get halfway there, it hits another ship, they go down, kills him. And he goes, finally, on the button of the passage back, he gets to the spot where they died, and he writes, It Is Well With My Soul. Now, that's not to say that as far as those questions of why and things like that, I don't actually ever thought, I, I think I thought why. That's just me personally. Just because that happened to me in that moment mm -hmm. of it is well with myself. Now, when everything went happened with that tornado, mm -hmm. that's when the being strong emotional person came back on me. Mm -hmm. Because I could barely make it. I would just cry for no apparent reason while we're searching this spree. Mm. Really? Because that's when it hit me of that situation. But to that's me, wild. it's it's the moment of why, regardless of the tragedy, is what's going to need to be felt in the months that carry on. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's to me is where it's at because it's to me where the church misses it. And I can say this because I'm not, w you know, and I say the church, I mean everybody. Because they can have empathy and they can have this and they can have that. But sometimes you just got to on back. Hmm. There, there's, because I think, I think you bring up a couple excellent points. And I, I think there's, there's two, you know, we'll separate them here, two groups. Uh, there, are, there are people who use these type of things to challenge the existence of God, an atheist or whoever, you know, that were not even impacted. They'll yeah. just, they'll, they'll ask the questions like you ask. Yeah. And I think there are theological answers that, that, you know, for those people. I think there's theological answers for that. Uh, but now you're, you're right. There are people who have been through these things. There are people who have been through a tragedy. And, and even pastorally, they're coming and searching and asking why. Uh, like, like you just said, it was very interesting because I was going to bring that up. My wife and I suffered a miscarriage um, um, years ago. Um, and, you know, my dad was shot in that robbery and, and um, his health went downhill uh, rapidly and he, he passed away at, at 52. Uh, so you have those kinds of things that happen and, and, and we do have a tendency, I think you bring up a great point, we have a tendency, you say how does the church respond? We have a tendency sometimes to go to people who are suffering tragedy and, and quite honestly we do say maybe kind of silly things. I understand we say them trying to help. Um, maybe the, well you know heaven needed another angel. Exactly. Uh, you know it's we're trying to help, and we don't know what to say in those moments. Don't ever say that, by the way. Yeah, that's not, you know, we don't it's know what to say to in those moments. So when you ask the question, how does the church respond? I do think there's a theological response for those people who would attack, you know, so to speak, God over this, or attack, attack the existence of God or the goodness of God because of this. But you are right. For people who are suffering, we need that wisdom to, you know, what do you say? I was, Job, uh, in Job 2, um, it says... When his friends went to him, um, who, you know the story, Job's three friends heard of all the evil that had come upon him. They came each from his own place. When they saw him at a distance, they did not recognize him. They raised their voices and wept. They tore their ro robes, sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven, and they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. Now, if Job ended there, we could speak pretty good of his friends. They went on <laughs> later to try to explain to Job why it happened. Yeah. But you know, for seven days, they just sat with him. Well, that I was it. They just sat with him in his suffering. And sometimes I think that may be the best response, and I, yeah. is to go and be with people and not try to give an explanation, just love them in those well, moments. You know, and with the church, like you said it, you know, what's the church? Well, multifaceted, like he said, but you also got the community outreach part of the church of doing what they're doing and, yeah. and providing the food and shelter and doing all that. And it, it's, it's like he said, it's the measured loss of anything unexpected 
whether it be his father that had, you know, it, whatever it is, that's the core of that why question. It's the unexpected uncertainty of it, yeah. which everyone should realize that that's life. Yeah. But we know it until it happens. Mm -hmm. But he's right. The best way to treat that grieving person, with the exception of if you've been through it. Yes. If you've been through it, you have a way yeah. to communicate because then you're bonded because the bonded person to another person who had an e a shared experience or sometimes the ability of someone to connect with another through experience is one of those things where you have weaknesses and strength and the weakness may have been you went through this. But to God, every weakness is a strength. With the overcoming of that, that's where you can help the person out to, you know, to reconcile them back. But it's like he said, the best way to hold a grieving person is, is the arms of grace, bar none. Yeah. None. And that's, that's, you know, and is it a physical holding? No, I mean, although every time you see that person, if you want to give them a hug, I don't care if they're a hugger or not. <laughs> you, you try just hugging people randomly. And I don't mean that to sound frivolous or anything like that, but if you start meeting everybody you come in, I, now bear in mind, if you start hugging strangers, you, 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 can get some, <laughs> you can get some bad things happening, and this is the South, and pistol permits are, you know, anyway. But, you know, family members, and especially the ones that are a little standoffish emotionally anyway, the stoic people, they the best ones. Because half the time, they don't know what you're going to do. And you ain't got to make, if you like, hug them and you make noises, Uncle, bad things can Uncle occur. Uncle Carl. <laughs> yeah. Hug Uncle Carl. But I'm just saying, if you hug somebody, and even if it's an unexpected hug, you talking about something that'll light somebody's light up yeah. for one day or for one moment? You know, and that's the kind of grace mm -hmm. or measure of faith or, you know, measure of God mm -hmm. that you give to another person because it's some, you know, Y'all got all these nice little things where y'all can pull up chapters and verse, and I'm shooting from the hip here. Uh, in the book of Psalms, it talks about that there are jars where God, or bottles or jars, I can't remember the reference, where God catches every tear we cry. And in situations like this, you know, we think about God in terms of the omniscient, the omniscient, and the all-powerful because of storms and everything. I think we seldom realize the God who catches tears and the God who weeps in our time of trouble because if Jesus wept as John 11:35 knows and every good PK's kid pastor's kid knows John 11:35 because it's the shortest verse in the Bible yeah. that's just one of those ones if you get that spur of the moment I got to quote something boom you got it Psalm you know, 56 for you by the way well there you go see this reference in Google Bible is really great I, gotta, <laughs> if I could just carry him with me when I go yeah, places yeah. as long as we got a Wi-Fi connection that would work <laughs> I've got a hot spot on my phone awesome. you're good be awesome. <laughs> but with that you know people know the God of, of love you know the God of vengeance the God you know who controls this but do they know that God cries with you because you know Jesus said everything I've seen the Father do I do yeah and Jesus wept he wept in more than one and, and, you place, know, too. More, you know, Lazarus <laughs> over Jerusalem. Yeah, he just didn't cry. He didn't go that man cry and just yeah. mm, let it out one time and go on. But yes, but Jesus said that. So we, if he said it, that means God does it. Yeah. So sometimes in these times of mass destruction and, you know, property and, and uh, everything that has happened in the past, you know, we've had 177 tornadoes in the past 12 months in the state of Alabama, <laughs> more God. than any place in the United States. That's unbelievable. And, like, if you look down to the top five, you don't hit the quote unquote Torno Alley, you know, Kansas and Missouri till you get to four and five. Yeah. Wow. Everything That's else is crazy. the southeast. Yeah. But in those times, it's I think it's important to impart wherever how you can and I think sometimes it's just being there. Yeah. You know, that God weeps too. I mean, it it's it's something that people don't think of that in our time of trouble that we are where we're at. Mm -hmm. And it's like the old foot what is it, footprints in the sand thing? You know, we carry, and I know it's kind of, yeah. we all kind of think it's easy, and for some reason, I think Pat Moon. I don't know why that <laughs> happens. It just comes to me in that realization. But it, it's, it's cheesy, yeah. but you know it's true. Absolutely. And that's in these times of where we're going to face, because the aftermath of what your mother in law is going to have to go through is not good. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the sense of, you know, you're going to be able to get this and get this, but it's going to take some time to readjust, mm -hmm. refine stuff. You know, and that's one of and the different people, different things mean more to them. Right. And we can understand that we're alive, and that's great. Yeah. But it, it, I, I want to say something, too, along those lines, based on what you said. And, and this is um, just, you know, for 
for people who are you know, maybe watching this. Everybody's been through something. You know, okay, we're talking about tornadoes. Uh, we've talked about miscarriages. We've talked about violence and death. We, everybody's been through something. So if it's a, uh, you know, if it's a molestation, it's, if, it's a, if it's a rape, if it's a, uh, uh, if it's a divorce, if it is, I mean, whatever. I mean, you know, everyone's been maybe betrayed. Uh, First Corinthians, uh, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 says, God comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Now, I, we go through stages on those things. And, you know, m the, the miscarriage that my family faced was years ago. And, and I look back now, and I, I can speak from a place of healing on that. I couldn't have done that six months after it happened or three months after it happened. I can years later. And this is what the Bible directs. Allow God to bring healing. Allow God to comfort you because one day you are going to meet someone who's been through what you are. And that's, look, I'm, I'm a pastor. I've never been sexually abused. I can speak to a general exactly. degree about what the Bible says, but I can't speak to someone who's been through that the way that someone else who's been who's through, been, it, who's been through can. it can. And so if you, whatever you've been through, let God bring comfort. Sometimes what we want to do is we want to hide those things we've been through. We want to bottle them up. We want to keep them kind of within ourselves. And we want to do that and put a mask on and go, what the Bible says is deal with it. Let, let God deal with you. Let God help you. Let God heal you. Because one day you'll have that opportunity to comfort someone else. Yeah. Um, I, I don't remember who it is. There's a pastor that says, uh, don't, you know, don't waste your hurts. Um, don't. The things that you've been through, work them out with God, work them out with His people, knowing that one day someone needs to hear your story, someone needs to hear you know the, who, what you've been through. The tornado is every broken heartedness you've went through. Mm -hmm. yeah. As Jesus, you know, what did Jesus when He's in the synagogue? I've, you know, to heal the brokenhearted from, I guess it's Isaiah when He does that whole list. Yeah. If it wasn't such an important thing, you know, because he mentions all the heals the sick. He mentions all those other, bring freedom to the captives. Mentions all that other stuff, but he throws in there, heal the brokenhearted. Yeah. And to me, that's sort of a catch that goes, whoa. You know, that's really more important in it because every country song in the world talks about heartbreak. Or, and, you know, I mean, we kind of think of it in frivolous terms sometimes. We do. But when he says it there, mm -hmm. you kind of got to, if you got paying attention here, this is where you put your ears on. Because it's like, whoa, this is bigger than we thought. The most cathartic thing that happened with me after that miscarriage was a friend of mine worked on a shift with me, basically pregnant at the same time in that area. Well, four weeks after mine, he had one. And, uh, and I'll, I'll have to admit, you know, I'd hear him making doctor's appointments, going here and going there, and that, that stung. Sure. And, and, and that's just human nature. It wasn't nothing against him. Yeah. He's probably one of the most genuine people I ever know in my life. I give, you know what I'm saying? He's a yeah, great so. guy. It's just you hear it, and, and then that happens to him. Mm -hmm. And when he finally comes back after being off and everything, and I waited a good while, and it was just me and him one night late, and we got to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And that was cathartic more than anything. Uh, just us going back and forth with each other. You know, and I and I told him I said I, I told him that I heard the song. It is well in my soul, and I and I thought about that, and I was writing something about it. And the, what I wrote was, "It is well with my soul, but not so with my heart," mm -hmm. because you can know the truth of anything yeah. and still yeah. feel the pain of the actual event. Yes. But I still remember. I think one of the biggest things that got me, or kind of pushed me forward to some degree is, is when I heard that it is well with my soul getting in my Jeep and then God spoke to me and said now this is what you, I want you to do I want you to love that woman more than anything you love in your mm -hmm. life I want you to hold her in her heart I'll hold you in mine mm -hmm. you hold her in hers yeah absolutely but talking to him like you said that was what you know but I've always believed that that it is our tornadoes in this reference, mm -hmm. in this life, that gives us the ability to reach people, as Paul said, I've become Absolutely. all things to all men that all might be saved. Chase can talk to people that I can't talk to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can talk to people I can't talk to. You can talk to people. 
and it's all different, but That's it's it. becoming all people. <laughs> which yeah. is where we all become, you know, we're all ministers of the gospel, and it is amazing how God works in your life to put you in the lives of people who need to hear your story exactly. and who need to hear what, who, what you've been through. And, 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 you know, throw it back over there to you guys, but I, I, we need to, you, you were preaching the message this morning about, you know, walking in the power of God, and, and you know, we lack the power was the name of, your me of the message. Um, there is a, there's a, there's a wisdom we need to walk in that is not of, our, of ourselves. And I think there is a, an answer we need to be able to give to people, atheists or whoever they are. I mean, th just those people who are saying, where's God? You know, who are mocking uh, because of this that's happened and pointing to it. We need to have those answers for people. We need, to, we need to have those answers about why these things happen theologically. But we need to be ready to comfort those who are in affliction, whether it is just with our presence or with the comfort that we have been given. And to do that, we do not need to walk in human wisdom or human words or little sayings that we come up with. We need to walk in a deep wisdom and power of God that is well beyond what we have it's on, basically on our own. It's basically the principle of, of the reality of faith. Yeah. We don't give Sunday school answers. Mm -hmm. And that we un understand salvation not to be some track I'm going to give you. <laughs> not to go and be this three-point thing, you do this, and we get to get out of hell free card. The true salvation of man says, you know what? You were in hell, and you knew you were in hell, and it pulled you from the gate. That's salvation because you know where you were, and you know where you got mm -hmm. to. That's salvation. And when you've got that understanding, that realization, then you're talking from the heart. You're not talking from the head. Yeah. In particular, I think we don't give... Sunday school answers as a substitute for sacrificial love. And too often in the church we do that. We try to give a, a pithy saying or something really quick and, you know, God bless you there, and then we go and live our lives because we don't want to suffer with those people, but we're called to. Um, guys, it's been a great discussion. Uh, I, I want to throw out a couple of things I think we probably better close up. There are wounds that will happen in this lifetime caused by tornadoes or sicknesses or whatever that will not be healed in this lifetime. Now, maybe they could, maybe they couldn't. I don't know. But I, I know there are wounds that are caused in this lifetime that will not be healed in this lifetime because Jesus in Revelation 2 says that at the end of time, he will wipe away every tear. And that says to me there are going to be tears that lead up to that time that will not be healed. And, and, and so what we have, what we have here is a, a world that is devastatingly fallen. Now, I've, I've preached funerals for, for babies and children where there's just nothing to say. There's no hope, nothing but just incredible pain. And, and I, I have no idea how those people will ever fully recover. I don't know that they could. I don't even know if it, I don't even know if it's possible. Even if it is possible, some of these people that have had the, these devastating wounds will suffer with them in their entire life until the end of time. You guys have been talking very effectively about how we, how we handle that. We won't give just little brief answers. We sacrificially love. We uphold theological truth. We walk with people. That, uh, and, and we were particularly able to be used to bring healing to people that, that God has healed us in, in those kind of areas. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably appropriate to, to close with a, this little passage. You quoted Romans 8 before. I'll, I'll quote the end of it. I'll read the end of it. Um, we're guaranteed tribulation. We're guaranteed pain. We're told that Jesus at the end of time will wipe every tear. This is a radically fallen world, horribly fallen. The solution, by the way, for the fall, the, the cross, mm. was, a, was a terrible solution. Terrible fall, incredible solution. Incredible solution that was also terrible in that it involved the sacrifice of the Son of God. But this is Paul. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, is the word tribulation, hardship, persecution, famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, and he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There will be trouble in this world, deep, deep trouble that is almost unspeakable. But even then, that is unable to separate us from the love of God. So I just, uh, I encourage you watching, I encourage all of us to not love in a shallow way, but love in a, in a deep way, because this is a broken, fallen world, and, and tornadoes, like you're talking about, hit every day, every hour, uh, every location. Can I tack something into that? Absolutely. You know, in this time, um, I had a lot of people reach out to me, uh, you know, in, in by proxy to my in-laws. Yeah. And, you know, we've basically gone silent on communication. And, and my concern is that there may be a lot of people out there that um, some people wear their emotions, you know, like a costume and you know. And then there's people that just don't. And they're going to put up the they're going to put up the facade. They're going to put up um, that that shield, and you're not going to see. Um, you know, I know that the Bible talks about at the end, He will wipe away every tear. Yeah. But Jesus also promised us the Comforter in in this life. Now it doesn't promise but any comfort, okay? But wherever you are, you can have a degree of peace. You can that That's you true. that you allow yourself to have. That you seek God for, and it, it doesn't have to come at the, the you know during a service or hanging out with friends. Or but the Comforter is here. If if the Holy would, Spirit, the, the Holy Comforter. Spirit, yes, I, 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 you know, He is here for us, and you know. Just don't, don't think you have to be on your own, even if you feel that way. Yeah. Even if you don't know how to trust a, a, a person in that way. You know, you're talking about you and your friend, you know, your colleague, you finally were able to talk about the mis miscarriages together. There's some people that have gone through atrocities. They don't feel like they can talk to anyone through. But there is a comforter that's available to us, the Holy Spirit, um, even if we don't know how to communicate that with, with someone. And I believe through that healing, you know, through that comfort, God can bring healing um, to a degree yeah, in, in his right, life. I, I agree. So, totally. uh, you know, because I know, I know, you know, my mother-in-law hasn't talked a lot about it yet, mm -hmm. but I, I believe that I believe that the, the Holy Spirit is covering her and, and, and keeping her right now. Yeah. And I believe he's doing that for a lot of people. And I just, I want to encourage anyone watching that may be feeling alone that they don't have to, even if they don't know how to express what they're going through. Yeah, great word. Great great place to end. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Uh, good job today. Thank you, David, Chris, Nick. Uh, we're at faith2.com, the number two. We just want to encourage you to subscribe. Tell your friends about us. Faith2.com. We'll see you next week.